I think we were all in a little bit of whiplash. One day we're all marching for one cause and then the next day we're all marching for another cause and it becomes the most important cause and it's like it's like throw your pussy out out the window now you're onto this like and and like how did all of a sudden we're chanting Intifada revolution like I don't know This is the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie My guest today is Nellie Bowles who co-founded the immensely popular Substack publication The Free Press where she writes TGIF a weekly news roundup that has earned a fanatical following She's also the author of the brand new book, Morning After the Revolution, Dispatches from the Wrong Side of History, a deeply reported account of how America responded to COVID lockdowns and racial unrest in 2020 and 2021, and her tumultuous tenure at the New York Times. This interview was recorded at a live event in New York City. Here is the Reason interview with Nellie Bowles. Nelly, thanks for talking to Reason. It is such a pleasure to be here and such a pleasure to be talking to you. So, the reviews. <laughs> I thought I was going to start with the elevator pitch. Yeah, well, we'll get to that in a second, but the reviews are not good. Here's The Guardian. <laughs> the Guardian says, morning after the revolution, a bad faith attack on woke. The New Yorker calls it Nellie Bowles's failed provocations. Wired, there's nothing revolutionary about morning after the revolution. <laughs> and then on the right, the Federalists managed, in morning after the revolution, Nellie Bowles can't pick a side. So <laughs> what is... I think is, they're calling me a bisexual. Uh, yeah, I'm well, not yeah, sure. You know, I, if the uh, I, shoe I, the fits, guys are right? really, really riled up. So what is the elevator pitch for morning after the revolution? Thank you, Nick. The, ele- <laughs> the elevator pitch that I was thinking, what would be a good elevator? It's um, have the last few years felt a little crazy? <laughs> have they felt a little maybe funny? Do you want to read about the craziness and some of the funniness? Then you should buy The Morning After the Revolution by Nellie Bowles. Okay. That, is that good? Uh, that works for me. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, we're on you know on a high level floor that fills up the time. The book is set during the pandemic in the summer of what's become known as the racial reckoning, twenty twenty through about the end of twenty twenty one. Before we get into some of the issues that you go deep on, how important is you know was the pandemic and the lockdown, mm. and then the viral video, particularly of George Floyd's death. How important was the viral video of George Floyd's death? I mean, that that started the whole thing. And, and I think the lockdown and the way in which we were all separated from our social communities, separated from our ties, separated from all of the things that keep us kind of reasonable and normal and bumping into strangers, the, the, that was all torn apart. And so we could just live online and we could just live online with people we agreed with and we can just live online with the sort of craziest voices that were going the most viral. And and I think that really set it off. And to some extent, uh, the lockdown was perpetuated and, and kept much longer than it needed to be kept even after mm-hmm. the vaccines and stuff, in part because I think that some of that radicalism and some of that rage was very useful for a mm-hmm. political movement and moment. And it it created, I think, the movement that now has led to where we are now with like the pro Hamas protests on campus or mm. pro Palestine protests, or whatever, however you want to phrase it, um, where violence is a normal part of the rhetoric. Clearly, uh, the George Floyd video in particular, which itself is part of the lockdown or it wouldn't have had the same effect absent the lockdown. What started the trends? I mean, the, the things that you're writing about in the book, the, the, the revolution is really around race relations, it's around gender, um, it's around a, an orientation towards government power. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what's been going on in the 20th, 21st century that gave rise, that, you know, that, that pulled together all of the chips or the kindling that then exploded? I think that you had um, a lot of people who were very comfortable in a lot of ways in their life and things were very good and all of a sudden there was a lot of money flowing into society with the stimulus money and so people had free time they had 
cash on hand. Um, and they had this video, which was a horrific video. And um, the, the, the sort of whatever we want to call it, the woke movement, the, the, the new progressive movement, um, had been rising for a while. That, that wasn't invented with George Floyd. That didn't start right after that. Um, but I think the confluence of um, the money, the boredom, and the video of a murder it created that moment, that fire. One of the uh, things that you come back to again and again in the book is, uh, you know, the concept of defunding the police. All cops are bastards, mm-hmm. ACAB, which Very became popular a popular notions. graffiti. Um, talk a bit about how that played out. I mean, one of the most interesting things, and this is something I think that the reviews uh, from people who disagree with you politically just yeah. overlook um, but the stories that you tell again and again come back where the people who are supposed to be liberated by the revolution end up suffering the most. And can you talk a little bit about that in terms of how did defunding the police, what kind of effect did that have on people who, whose name it was supposedly being defunded for? Yeah. So one of the first chapters in the book, I go up to Chaz. Um, the Seattle Autonomous Zone that became very famous, and that there was sort of a reporting blackout. We weren't supposed to cover it. I write about getting in trouble with my colleagues for trying to go. Um, and you were at the New York Times. I was at the New York started. Times, and it was sort of a question of like, why do you want to go? Like, what are you expecting to see there? And like, you, 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 we shouldn't pay too much attention to Antifa. We shouldn't pay too much attention to these things because um, they're not really stories. It's like how NPR handled the Hunter Biden laptop. It's not a story. Um, and I went up there and what was the most interesting thing was the people who were really suffering in the Chaz autonomous zone were these small business owners who had moved there because it was the neighborhood. It was the gay neighborhood. So they were like, uh, like South Asian small business owner who has a little cafe who is being harassed by Antifa because he doesn't want them to keep breaking his glass. And I think time and again, at at this point, it's almost cliche, but time and again, we saw spaces where the community didn't want the police abolished. The community was fighting for police to remain and maybe even be increased. I mean, you saw this in Oakland. Um, There was a scene where a group of black parents are reading the names of all the, uh, this was when the crime wave came a couple years later, reading the names of people who had been killed in, in the crime wave. And the, they were surrounded by protesters who came to the sort of outskirts of the scene and were screaming and yelling that they were white supremacists, that they were uh, perpetuating violence. And it was, it, that was playing out across the country. And, and I think so it's still you to have, some extent playing out. Yeah, where you have minorities, racial and ethnic minorities, asking for structure and, and good policing yeah. being attacked as white supremacists by white Antifa members. Yes, over and over and over and over. What's and the humor in that? You see. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, because it, I mean, it's because kind of, absurdity, it's stunning, right? Because the absurdity yeah. of these scenes and just the, just the absurdity of these, uh, the silliness of it in a way. And I think like Rob Henderson has that amazing um, luxury beliefs idea that he's coined, which is like, all these rich people and all these privileged people want things that don't impact them at all. If you live in a beautiful gated community, if you live in an apartment in New York or have a doorman especially, you're not worried about security. You can be abolish the police all you want. You're not, it's not a real part of your life. And so that's, he describes this as a luxury belief. So in the same way of like um, abolishing the SAT is a luxury belief because it's not important if you don't need the SAT to prove your bona fides. You can right. say you did dressage and whatever. Um, and, and I think there's some, I think it's really just funny. And, and I also think it's like, um, it's funny to me how so many good intentions and so much money behind those good intentions went to such odd places. Well, uh, one of the things in a chapter that you wrote called Abolitionist Entertainment LLC, uh, you you note that the Washington that's a Post. Real, that's the real name. Abolitionist yep. Entertainment LLC is the real name of yeah the Black Lives Matter co-founders um, LLC that where she funneled a lot of money through. 
Um, you, you noted that the Washington Post estimated that $50 billion was promised to groups fighting racism between mid-2020 and mid-2021. Where did that money go? Your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. I mean, in part, it went to pretty fabulous things. It went to a party house in L.A., like a really chic party house that they bought um, that was bought with nonprofit funds. So the address could be reported. You're allowed to report a nonprofit address. But, of course, that it was sort of blocked on big um, social media companies for the address being shared. And um, the money went to another party house in, in Toronto. The money went and to— And this is simply for Black Lives Matter, right? Mm -hmm. the com or the group that was co-founded by Patrice Kahn. And it Colors. went to just normal yeah. scam stuff. I mean, where does the money, where does the money that mm -hmm. L.A. or San Francisco pays to— homelessness service, homeless services go. Just like basic scams. People hire their siblings. Uh, the Black Lives Matter founders hired siblings, parents, ex-boyfriends, slash current boyfriend. It, it, the list goes on. You can imagine how you spend money. You know, money. some people even start businesses with their spouses, right? <laughs> I, I suppose. You know, so. I'm, so I'm uh, a proud yeah. Nepo spouse of... Uh, um, <laughs> You know, how did your, when you came back from Chaz, and I remember, I'm not sure if we knew each other uh, by the time that story came out or not, but I remember reading that, and it was, it's, it's a stunning piece in the New York Times because the victims of the group that is controlling the Chaz spot in Seattle are almost inevitably, they're, you know, as you were saying, they're small business people, often of uh, racial or ethnic minorities. What did your what did your colleagues at the New York Times say after oh. that story ran? Were they were they? Oh, it is worth reporting. Well, on. It was funny because the bosses at the Times were always trying to keep a lid on this. They're still trying to keep a lid on this. But no, my colleagues went crazy. They went berserk with it. It was like normal people who I'd been friends with and who were reasonable people went berserk in these years. And it, all what, of a sudden- Why was that? I mean, because they're, I mean, are the New York Times, are they like, you know, celebrities? Are they so different than the rest of us that they're living in, on a well, different planet? Well, first I don't or? think it was limited to the Times at all. Like, I think the experience that I had, uh, a lot of people are having it in a lot of mainstream media institutions. I think you have the same thing at NPR. I mean, obviously, Uri Berliner wrote mm -hmm. an amazing essay about what was going on in NPR that just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, I think there was a, I mean, okay, to steel man it. There was a panic about the risk of Trump and a panic about, y you have someone who is unpredictable, who's a little scary as a person. And, and you're sort of like, that's the most important thing. We just have to make sure he doesn't get elected. We just have to not give anyone fodder to make that happen. And I think that was a genuine and earnest hope and desire. And so I don't think it's people just like maliciously deciding they want to be censorious assholes, even if that's how they kind of ended up being. But I think it was like, we're in grave danger. And we all need to work together to prevent what might be like the end of democracy. And that's how it's always phrased. Like Trump winning would be the end of democracy. But then you get and they in, really believe that. And you get into this thing where we have to, in order to keep the end of democracy from happening, we have to kind of erase democracy. So he can't win. I, I mean, yeah. The, the, I mean, it's a kind of Vietnam logic. That's yeah, a little you hear bit this all the time. Right? It's really weird. You know, you, uh, you write uh, by October 2021, only 23% of black Americans wanted police funding cut in their area, according to Pew Research. So yeah. it's a you know, reputable survey group. How did, you know, did that filter into your colleagues or to the media no. coverage? And, and why wouldn't it? Because, again, I mean, one of the things um, you, you kind of conjure up in the book, and it's very compelling, and it, it strikes me as convincing that, you know, the media saw themselves as the guardians yeah. of the poor and the yeah. dispossessed in American society. But then when they hear stuff from those people, they're like, no, you really don't know what you need. Yeah, that's the attitude, that, that these people don't know what's best for them. And, and there, there's a philosophy behind it. I write about in the book this sort of... Um, the new anti-racist movement became a sort of therapeutic movement, right? And there's chapters I can <laughs> ramble on about, about what that looks like and what those therapy sessions look like. But one thing it meant was that it, whiteness and internalizing whiteness, it has to do with race. 
but not entirely. And so when a black person saying they want more police, they maybe have internalized some whiteness in there, maybe internalized some white supremacy. When, when an Asian family in San Francisco is arguing that we still need elite high schools, test, test in high schools, they were accused of, of being white supremacists. Um, and that's not an anomaly. That's, not, that's part of the philosophy. It's that white supremacy doesn't know race exactly. It, it's not mm -hmm. the most coherent, I'm going right. to be honest, but, but it's that an Asian family wanting to ha keep Stuyvesant or Lowell High School is, is showing a white supremacy. So that's kind of how I think it was thought of within the times, within NPR, within all these places. Because all these places, they're smart people. They're reading these stats. They see that this isn't actually popular. This isn't actually what the folks in this community want. One of the uh, most interesting sections of the book has to do with white women in particular, where, who you know really seem to, and I say this as a white man or as you know, uh, yeah, as a white man. Thank you for <laughs> for taking the heat because up through about 2019, it was like okay, white men were the problem. During the pandemic white women and the lockdown, became, white women became oh, the problem. Oh, it was our time to shine. Yeah, it uh, was. What? How? I, I, I guess first. To, uh, remind us, because one of the great things that you do in the book is remind us of kind of sheer insanity, f not from a hundred years ago. Um, you know, this isn't learning about doctors using electric, you know, vibrators to cure women's hysteria <laughs> in the 19th century. This is from like 2021. Yeah. Uh, what is race to dinner? And oh what, my God. And how does that exemplify? I thought you'd never ask. How does that exemplify the kind of madness that we were all kind of under? Well, one thing I do in the book is I go to a couple anti-racism courses. And um, Race to Dinner is one of these. It's a dinner. I didn't actually go to Race to Dinner. I went to the Robin D'Angelo one, which was a four-day long. I, of course, also did the um, extra credit two-day long one. Um, race, race to Dinner, you pay $5,000 for them to come and kind of berate you. You gather a group of white women together, obviously. And then they come and they berate you about your whiteness. But... Um, anti-racism and the work of it used to be like hard and sort of like dismal. It was like uh, people getting together in Berkeley to try to change laws and try to write books about this and that and try to um, do campaigns in third world countries. And what happened in the last 10 years, thanks to a few really interesting white women, um, is they presented a model for anti-racism that didn't involve any of that. It didn't involve um, trying to learn about your local laws and do all this nonsense and community meetings. It involved working on yourself. <laughs> Seriously. It involved changing your internal whiteness. And so you had things like Tima Okun, who came out with a list. And it was the list of white supremacy traits, white supremacy characteristics. Can you explain who Tima Okun is? She became my obsession. Um, she, um, was a anti-racist instructor. Her background was in physical therapy. She had been a, a clogger and, um, <laughs> she literally sounds like someone I would be friends with. So she's like, I'm, I, 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 yeah. And, um, she came out with a list after what she describes as a particularly frustrating meeting in some of these anti-racist groups. And the list was of these traits. And, the traits include things like right to comfort, individualism, um, sense of urgency, worship of the written word. And she said, these are white traits. These are things that white people value that are unique to white culture. And in order to fight racism, we need to work on ourselves and, and sort of get excavate those, get rid of those. And this list that to me now saying it sounds wildly racist. I mean, like saying this out loud sounds insane. Um, it became very popular. It became very mainstream. So mainstream, in fact, that the Smithsonian Museum made a poster of the list, graphically designed, beautiful, like the list of white supremacy traits. And now, of course, it's all trying, people are trying to memory hole it and say this never happened, right. but it happened. And um, so that then spurred a whole movement of these, these workshops 
Robin D'Angelo being sort of the most famous voice of this, but there are tons, tons of these workshops. And the workshops were you would get together and you would work on your perfectionism and your sense of urgency and just, just getting rid of that. And, and it feels really good. And white women, it turns out, love that shit. Hmm. We, we love to work on ourselves. We love to self-flagellate. Um, so it clicked and it took off. And actually these guys argue uh, that the goal is not, uh, Tima has a quote that is in the book where she says, the goal is not to expand the boardroom table. The goal is not to get more people in the boardroom. The goal is to dismantle the boardroom altogether. So it's like, stop trying to impose your white supremacy logic and try to like bring more people into capitalism. You got to just get rid of capitalism. It, it yeah, and, and this became the winning doctrine of the day. And I think we're still living in it, even as, you know, now people kind of laugh at some of these ideas right, Robin D'Angelo, but it, it won. Yeah. This is the model. It was, uh, particularly in reading the uh, your encounters uh, with uh, Uken, um, her talking about urgency as white supremacists, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, anybody familiar with Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail would recognize he's, saying we need to be urgent like we can't wait any longer it just is peculiar that that would win an argument i think i think it's a little bit kind of more fun and it's i mean if you tell me nelly you need to work on your perfectionism you got to release that i love that and it's <laughs> And instead of a yoga mat, you can buy, you know, a, a package of programs and yeah, things like that. So yeah. there's a, accessorizing. It really works. Um, I loved, I mean, I had fun in the course. Like I, tell, I like. Yeah, what were some of the exercises? I you did? cried. Oh my God. The exercises were like, feel your white skin, like tap, rock, a lot of rocking, a lot of then, <laughs> and then humming. You'd hum. I'm dead serious. And it works. I was in it. I was feeling it. I was. I cried like a few times. But you're not supposed to cry, right? Or no, that's no, at race to dinner. No, you're definitely supposed to cry. Oh, but at race to dinner, but you're not tears, allowed to cry. White tears, but yeah. you still have to do the white. No, no, there's no way out. So you're doing the white tears because you're supposed to do them, but then also white tears. Not good. Can't be used for manipulation. And it, it, it I mean, it just works very well. By the end, I was. I felt trapped within it after the, I guess, six days altogether. It was a weird time. I felt trapped within that thinking because there's no way out in this thinking. It's not, it's intentionally not like productive. It's intentionally, there's no like thing you're supposed to do. And in fact, the, the lessons they tell you are to spend more time just with white people that you should, it, it, it's very like, the actual takeaways are sort of alarming. Like at the end, I was like scared. I was like, should I call up my Asian friends and apologize for something? Like, I it really is psychologically weird. And they say, don't work on anti-racism stuff outside of groups of white people. Like, if you're married to someone who's not white, that's pretty dangerous. Like, you might be harming them, and you should really think about that a lot. And and they say that. I mean, I remember at the end of one of the classes, he said, the teacher said. Um, doing this work may end marriages. And I was like, that doesn't seem very anti-racist. <laughs> like that, I don't know if that's the goal of what we should want here. But um, anyways, and, and again, as silly as it sounds, this is the philosophy that's won. Like, we're living in this. Do you, I mean, well, let's yeah, I'm, come I'm, to see whether or not we've kind of peaked and are on the other side of this or not in a second, but would you, um, you talk about the progressive stack. Oh, what is favorite. it and how does that work? And how did that kind of infuse a lot of the things you experienced? The progressive stack comes from a place that makes intuitive sense to me, which is like some people talk too much and especially no offense, white men, you know, they, they just are so assertive and they take over and, and maybe we should try to balance that out. But what it looks like in practice, in a lot of left-wing spaces, um, is you do a progressive stack where the most oppressed person, let's say everyone's around 
having a conversation, you're all doing input and you raise your hands, the most oppressed person goes first, then you rank the people and who was least oppressed goes last. And it kind of happens quickly or, but, or someone who's in charge of the conversation will manage it. It's different people, man. It's, it's, it's a little awkward when it's like standing up at a mic. Like I've seen a video of someone moving people physically to the back of the line to, to ask a question at a mic, you know? Um, but yeah, so this became kind of the guiding principle of conversation in progressive movements. And I was always curious, like, how exactly do you s decide who's most privileged and who's least privileged? And like, what about in like complicated, like you and I, it's yeah. obvious, right? Right. Clearly you're behind me. Uh, but, you know, I, but, it depends if we do a good Marxist analysis, your way ahead. But what so about? It's like, you know, class, baby, <laughs> class more than gender. Right. Well, that free press, I don't know. Yeah. That's I'm a Substack heiress. But um, the, like, what about like gay versus Latino? Who's in front? Not sure. Unclear. So it gets to it gets to quirky spaces, and I think the logic behind the progressive stack, and I write in this chapter about the movement of um, a lot of academics, especially who took on often Native American or Latina um, names and identities, and it was basically people who decided. I deserve to be further ahead in the stack. I don't deserve to be in the middle or towards the back. That's that's bullshit. Like I'm a professor of of English and I deserve to be a little bit further up. And so they would they a, a ton of, I mean we've read about maybe a dozen of these but there's more and it's it's um largely women who decided that they wanted to get further up in the stack. And it's so not they just, easy. they fake a, yes. a lineage or a heritage. Yes. And it, I mean, they'll put on accents. It helps if they have like maybe a little Italian blood or like mm. maybe a, they can take on a tan. Um, <laughs> do they look good in like heavy earrings? Um, and, and they, and it's not easy to commit to this. Like the women who did this, the professors, many, many professors, um, you have to basically cut yourself off from your family you have to cut yourself off from everyone who knew you before, who could expose this. It's it's a really radical decision once you decide to do this. And and um, you have to think about it. How desperate did these people feel to get a few steps ahead in the stack that they did this? Do they, um, you know, the the Indian who, or the, the actor who portrayed the Indian in the famous... Um, uh, ad in the 1969 1970, the crying Indian was actually an Italian American from Texas who came to believe, apparently, by most accounts, that he was actually Native American. Yeah, do the people you're talking about do they know they're fakers, or do at some point do the, are they like, No, this is who I am? Oh, god, I don't, I mean, I mean, we know they, like they Rachel Dolezal know. seems to be in a category. I was gonna of her say, own, I was but, gonna say, she, I think. She believes it. Most of them, most of the professors, I think they know it's not true. And eventually when they confess, they confess and apologize. Rachel Dole is also a unique character in this. Um, but most of them, they know. They know it's not true. But the rewards are so great. I mean, some of these ladies are, well, my favorite one, literally participated in various cancellations of um, a, a cancellation of like a, I think it was a music venue that named itself Winnebago. And she was like, that's it, appropriating indigenous culture. And like, she led that as a fake Native American. I mean, it was amazing. It was, um, but I think it's, it seems irrational. It seems crazy. And it takes a certain mania, obviously. But Right. Or you really commit to the bit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's not irrational in that the rewards are true. The rewards you get from it are real. Um, speaking of cancellation, one of the uh, great uh, phrases that you uh, use in the book, uh, you talk about a cancellation turducken, <laughs> um, yes. which yes. some of you may remember uh, this episode, but could you explain oh. what a turducken is and this cancellation turducken and what, well, turducken. how that exemplifies, you know, kind of the madness of, of the lockdown era? Uh, a turducken is a... Uh, turkey with a duck 
inside of it, and inside the duck is a chicken. That's a turducken. And so... It's delicious. <laughs> I've never... It yeah. seems disgusting. <laughs> have you really had one? Yes, I have. I've even had a vegan turducken, oh, and even they are good. <laughs> so it's like, when you put more stuff in the middle of something, it's always great. <laughs> it, it's like a taste treat. But, I, I know the libertarians don't believe in laws, but I yeah. think it should be illegal. <laughs> um, the, the, my favorite cancellation turducken was um, the, oh God, it, it started with this poor magazine editor. Um, it, it, let, me, let me make sure I get it right. I'm sorry. I'm like pregnant and sweating and, and my head is all over the place. No, that, uh, it, no, you, no, no you don't get to with, play those cards. Yes, I do. I never play that a card. Book about, no, 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 okay. no. It starts with the Bon Appetit yes, editor. That's right. And then it goes, and then it goes the Gimlet podcast team. And then, no, but there's one more. And then, and then, um, no, it starts with, who does it start? It's, oh my God. It I mean, starts with the Bon Appetit editor yes. who uh, oh, has so created a- Adam Rappaport. Yeah. Thank you. Guys, forgive who me. Who has and, been successful in doing, uh, having videos of people doing different types of food. Yes. And bringing in um, more diverse talent and he's really trying his best. Um, but there is a little bit of disruption within the Bon Appetit world. And they decide that Adam Rappaport is not a great guy. And they find a photo of him that he's posted and that actually I heard from someone recently is, is in his office, a photo that he had liked in which he is dressed as a Puerto Rican. And most damningly of all, it could have been sort of ambiguous because he was like wearing a, a you know, do rag and like wearing a, 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 um, a beater. I'm sure there's more PC way to say beater. Um, <laughs> And, but the thing that really damned him was his wife commented, my poppy. And so Adam was screwed. He was done. Um, and he was canceled. So then, down a, a few blocks away in Brooklyn, the team of Gimlet decide to do a podcast around Adam Rappaport and the cancellation and all this. And they decide they're going to do it so perfectly. They, they announce that they're not interviewing any of the white men for the podcast. They're not interviewing any of the perpetrators of this. They're only interviewing the victims of the Bon Appetit, my poppy scandal. <laughs> and, oh God. <laughs> and I mean, I was like, I was like, that's, that's pretty safe. You know, like you, that's, you're really going all out there. That's, that's safe journalism. <laughs> and, um, but. Then what happens, Shruti, who's the one of the leaders of this, I mean, it- She's the host of the podcast. She's, yeah. she's the host and PJ and all these. Um, so what happens is then she, it turns out, had not been fully supportive of the union. And the union drive was seen as the Gimlet union drive, which when you think of Gimlet, you think they'd certainly need a union. And, <laughs> and the, the leaders of the union drive decided to push her out because Shruti had been not totally on the good. And so how could she come in and do a thing about a cancellation when she was the, was so bad herself? And so after like, I think two episodes, no, one episode aired. And then the second episode was an apology. <laughs> and I think they aired, they ended up doing maybe three different sort of formal apologies with different dwindling numbers of people involved. Um, and she ended up having to resign, like half the Gimlet team resigned over this. And then eventually the reply all show all shut down altogether. And it was just like a, a complete mess. But um, it basically this and a couple other stories of, around really Brooklyn, really stay away from that place, guys. It's scary. I don't know what the hell is going on there. But um, <laughs> a couple other stories around Brooklyn for me represented like, there's no, you can never be pure enough. There's no, even if you only interview the non-white victims of my poppy, you are, you're, you're still in the line of fire. In the book, you take issue with the definition of the word, of the term lesbian that appeared until 2023 <laughs> at a Johns Hopkins uh, University webpage. 
They defined lesbian uh, by saying a lesbian is a non-man attracted to non-men. Okay. What's, the, the reason what's, why that what's was so wrong offensive. With, what's wrong with that definition? <laughs> because the same list of definitions defined a gay man as a man attracted to other mm, men. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, if you're going to erase lesbians, at least also erase them. Why do why do the gay men get that? No, but it, obviously these these um, I mean, first of all, the lists of verboten words kept growing over the last years, and we every few months I feel we still get a new list of verboten words. Um, but but it was like brown bag, all of this, and in among that movement of the list of verboten words is list of redefined words, and the key one that always seems to be needing to be redefined and or erased is anything to do with women and anything to do with the word woman. And you see places like Lancet, you see like prestigious medical journals and universities putting out these things that do everything they can to erase the word woman, but don't do anything around the word men. Like like any article about ovarian cancers is always about like people with ovaries. Any article about prostate cancers is about men. And it's just... I mean, there's a broader conversation to have about that. What whole. do you think is driving that? Because it, it does seem to be weirdly gendered. Um, and, you know, what? why is that happening? I feel like we probably have some TERFs in the room who could take this. Yeah. Where are my TERFs? Where are my TERFs? Yeah. Um, why do I think that's happening? I think there's a lot of sexism in this world, not to sound like a second wave feminist, but I like indigo girls, and I think there's a lot of sexism. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. And I say, they haven't yeah. been redefined yet as indigo birthing person. We're going to see. We're going to see. Future possible They've birthing stood strong. people. My yeah. indigos have stood strong. Okay. Um, but I think that, I mean, this is to then, so basically the last few chapters in the book talk about the movement around gender and around what we've seen, which in a lot of ways, First, you had the Antifa movement, you had these cities being taken over, then you had the kind of more corporate BLM movement, and then for about a year, most of the energy moved to the trans movement and to the, to the um, movement around women and how to define them. And um, I... And you, may I ask, yeah. uh, you are, you're not against trans people, right? And you, um, there are you. You have questions about at what at what age people should, uh, you know, transition and things like that. But you have uh, in one chapter in the book where you really uh, go through the writing of some prominent trans women. So these are people who were born male, um, and you really present them. I mean, their writings are starkly misogynistic. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about? You know, what yeah. you find offensive in that. Basically, there is a really interesting, very smart movement of trans writers who are writing about what it means to be a woman. And when what it means to be a woman has nothing to do necessarily with your body, even, even with medical transition, it's not necessary. It's being a woman is an internal state. And so then the question becomes, what is that internal state? And in the writing, that, that these trans women have put out, that's really smart and you should read it because it's fascinating and, and, and difficult. But it's basically, they're arguing that to be a woman is to be a vessel. It's to be submissive, it's to take. And that, that's the womanhood they embrace, that's the womanhood they love. And it's um, a really different vision of feminism than I'm used to. Um, and not to keep saying this, but it, it very much has been a winning philosophy. It very much has, and, and we're not supposed to point out the misogyny in it. We're not supposed to point out the, the insanity of it, a lot of it. Like, uh, there's a chapter about, um, the very large movement of doctors who put out all these videos or would put out, go in, on, um, on stage and give talks about how very young children know when they're trans. Like toddlers can be giving gender language. Um, 
that when a toddler tears off a barrette, that's a gender message. And I'm, I'm serious. And they say this, and you, you hear a crowd applaud, and you're just like, what? And um, I think that there was and has been a movement to really reify gender and make it like, like, or gen and I mean gender, not sex. I mean gender, like womanness, like femaleness, like like um, pink skirts are somehow like very important to being a female. Um, and that when that toddler rips out that barrette, that that means they're uh, maybe gender questioning. And I think for me, as a gay woman, a lesbian, whatever I'm allowed to call it these days, I. So non man attracted non -man to non men. Attracted to non men. <laughs> I looked at a lot of that movement, and obviously I'm sort of like personally like, oh my God, I can't believe you would say that being a woman means to be a receiver and like that I just like want to be a whole. Like that's kind of, I don't know, I don't love that. But well, it, but, it's you, you brought up second wave feminism, and it's a return to a kind of essentialism. Yes. That Second wave feminism and, really rejected and, and moved beyond. Yeah, and I think some of the quotes, I mean, I really, in that chapter, I really just list a bunch of the craziest quotes that some of these doctors say about trans youth, that of gender nonconforming youth, that, that um, just all the ways they essentialize these kids and say that, that their behaviors mean something very specific. And I, as a person who grew up doing kind of gender nonconforming play, who had, I mean, my voice now is high because I'm sort of nervous, but normally it's so low. Like the audio book, the audio book is like, uh, it sounds like a funeral dirge. Um, and, and that's my natural voice. And, and I think that, um, I think about myself as like a 12 year old. I like, I came out as gay when I was 14. Basically as soon as puberty was done, I was like, I, yeah, I went through puberty a little young. I was like, I was like, I know I'm gay. And I, as a kid, played with trucks. I, I did all the things that you would be like, maybe this person is gender, like, certainly she's gender nonconforming. But maybe we should talk about other things. And I think for me, I'm really interested in this topic because I'm really glad that I have my bits and parts right now. And I think that young kids, uh, it's a little bit... I mean, talk about funny. It's a little funny to say that, like, a nine-year-old knows themselves that well. Um, so, how yeah. did uh, briefly? How do you think things went from kind of racial issues, which seem kind of straightforward, particularly after you know Breonna Taylor, uh, the, her uh, death at the hands of police, uh, but then also. Uh, uh, George Floyd, how, do, how does it jump from that to, and the discussions around that to gender? Because you're right, things shifted out of kind of race mode yeah. into, and now we're in a foreign I think we were policy all in a little mode, bit of whiplash. But, yeah. I mean, how do you think it shifted? It, it felt like one day we're all marching for one cause, and then the next day we're all marching for another cause, and it becomes the most important cause. And it's like, it's like throw your pussy out out the window, now you're onto this. Like, and, and like, how did all of a sudden we're chanting Intifada Revolution? Like, right. I don't know. It, yeah. it, these things, it, it, we could say, I mean, I guess the sort of uh, pat answer would be to say, social media, things go viral. So in the same way that things go viral and a news cycle so fast, on Twitter, on Facebook, a news cycle is now very fast in our social movements and, and very viral. Um, so, yeah, we kind of, I think we're all feeling like a little whiplash about each of these um, twists and, and where the next one comes and what the new set of rules is. And I'm hoping it's going to be for a balanced budget. <laughs> you know, I think that's, you know, but... Um, you let's talk a little bit about your hometown of San Francisco, which in many ways oh. was, you know, kind of one of the epicenters for everything that you're writing about. Um, what what destroyed San Francisco? And you have a long family history, go back generations there. You know, was it? Yeah. What what were the forces that destroyed San Francisco? OK, I don't think it's destroyed. I think that there's a big reform movement of like normal, sensible people like this, this crowd here basically, who's in San Francisco, who's like, this is enough, is enough. But what destroyed San Francisco? It's a city where 
It has a purity of politics that very few other places have. And it has a ton of money and a ton of smarts. So you have like a pure progressive city where there's no tension, there's no, there's no political battle, and things can just go as extreme as they want to go. And, and you see this in other places. You see this in Oregon with, the, with oh, well, I know you like this, with drug decriminalization. And, and you see the things kind of, and then now they move back. But in San Francisco, because of all the smarts and because of all the money, it became almost a parody of itself. So you had a district attorney who was arguing against prosecuting crime. He, he literally said, we shouldn't prosecute drug dealers because they are also victims and they have families to support. I, you know, and... You had the school arguing against reopening the school and, and who spent years on nonsensical things like renaming schools that were named for white supremacists like Dianne Feinstein. I mean, you had each, each kind of pillar of the city became the parody of itself, became the most unchecked version of itself. And... Um, why? I, I think because you know it's like good intentions. It's it's sweet, silly. You, you refer to uh, these forces in San Francisco as a sort of progressive libertarian nihilism. Yeah. Can you define that a little bit? It sounds okay. exciting. You know? <laughs> no, no. I, yeah. I want you to tell me a better term for this okay. because what what I'm trying to explain is, let's say the drug crisis, and this was really the thing more in, in certain ways, more than the New York times, more than like falling in love with bear, the thaw criminal, more than all of that. It was being in San Francisco and seeing people literally dying on the sidewalks for years of my life. And then seeing that accelerate, that kind of drove me to question a lot of things. And the reason I describe it as progressive nihilism or progressive well, um, slash, uh, libertarian, slash libertarian nihilism yeah. is because I think that there's a left wing or a liberal response to a lot of these issues. There's a liberal response to police brutality, which is train them more, which is give them more funding and make them better. That's not the response that Americans have. With abolish, it's a really different response. There's a liberal response to seeing people dying on the streets. And that's to say, let's get them help. And it's to say, it might be hard, but we have to force them to get help. We can't just leave them to die on that sidewalk, even if they really want to. And and I think you see that in a lot of cities in Europe, right? That are basically socialist, but but they they have a really different response to these problems that we all share. And so I was trying to describe, I think, the kind of a very American um, thread that comes in that says, no. That says, fuck it. We, we got to abolish the police altogether. It says, no, you can't force someone on the sidewalk into treatment. That, that, that violates their freedom. And I think that that's a really unique combination. Right. I would uh, say- But I don't know, what would part, you say? Well, particularly with ODs, I mean, this is fundamentally a, uh, a function of, of uh, fentanyl entering the drug supply. The only reason fentanyl is in the drug supply is because drugs are illegal. No, nobody's taking fentanyl in order to overdose. So that I might be a different. I know I'm not going to win a drug debate with you. Wow. Um, you know, and you're also not going to get any drugs from me. Where are your politics now? Um, I mean, because you, you talk about in the book how you, you were a liberal, certainly, uh, leaning to the left. I don't, you were never really a progressive, right? I'd like say a fiber. I was a progressive. I mean, yeah. Right? So, where are you now after all of what's transpired over the past couple of years? I, the, the easy sort of conversion story, and the one that I, I know those reviewers and whatnot want to put on anyone who questions or makes fun of some of this movement is to say, oh, now you're a right winger. Now you're a fascist. And I just reject that. I, I, obviously, I reject being a fascist. Right. But I, I reject Well, fascists <laughs> always do. I, well, yeah. yeah that's, as, they as, never admit it. As they would. Yeah. But I just reject that sort of like, like dumb binary and that dumb knee jerk within modern liberal spaces, progressive spaces that says, if you're not for every plank of this, if you're not for every step of this, then you're against it then you're the most extreme we can think of on the other side. And it's just silly. It's, it doesn't reflect how people actually are. So I don't know. I would say like I have some like sort of cheesy answer in there, which is like more exhaustion than doctrine. And 
I I think that that's I don't know. I, 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 so, I think well, most of us feel sort of like unmoored from an easy label and that's right. okay. And it's dumb, these labels and the lockstep. That nature. certainly that idea that if you believe one thing, then you here's another 10 things that you have to believe and go along yes. with, right? The, the linkage of all issues to other issues, yeah. unless they're libertarian issues. And then they all <laughs> make absolute perfect sense. And if you don't believe them all, just get the fuck out. Um, we're going to go to audience questions uh, in just a second. But uh, before we do that, um, how does social change, how does positive social change happen? You, you write in the book that feminism has given you a lot. You've benefited a lot from that. I think it's everybody in this room has benefited from feminism and a variety of social changes. I'm not just talking about sex, yeah. Nick. No, no, I, neither am I, neither am I. You know, sometimes I don't want to drive, you know? <laughs> uh, but I guess we're still talking about sex, so. Um, <laughs> In any case, you know, how does social change happen if not through the kind of overblown, you know, super public, out of control uh, demonstrations that, and, and well, arguing and yelling and shouting that we've seen over the past few years? Okay, two answers. One of them is that's not how a lot of social changes happen. Like, let's say the fight for gay marriage. There was a movement during that fight, a very prominent, loud movement that said, no, we don't want gay, movement of gays. Who said, no, we don't want gay marriage. That's heteronormative. Right, right. We don't, yeah. And they yep. said, no, and that's it took, Larry Kramer it took and sort of yeah. moderates or conservatives like an Andrew Sullivan to get us gay marriage because they said, uh, look. And now we can't keep a man. <laughs> no, so. no. It's, it's um, like Andrew Sullivan had to, a, bun a bunch of gays had yeah. to put on khakis and stand in front of white picket fences for us to get mm -hmm. gay marriage, okay? But didn't they and, also have to throw rocks at the police at Stonewall. So, so the, the broader question of like, who am I as someone who's so clearly benefited from progress to now stand and say, oh, well, this is silly. Oh, no, like not that. And that's something that I obviously wrestled with writing the book. It's something I wrestle with. Hey, mm. whoopah. Yeah. Um, it's something it's I wrestle a, with yeah. as a writer all the time. You always want to be thinking about that and thinking about like the generations before that got yeah. me the rights I have now. I mean, the right to vote, the right to drive, the right to be married to a woman, right. the right to make a baby with a woman. Yeah. Um, obviously, the help of a, a sperm donor. And um, mm. who is, I have to confess. So a non-woman who was probably <laughs> attracted to non-women, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and then Elon so. Musk came. And then, yeah. um, no. Are you making, uh, is that news? <laughs> Are you? No, I'm okay. Joking. Yeah. <laughs> America's sperm donor? Yes. Yeah. Um, the yeah. the but like who am I to stand up right. and say no? And how I think about it is, I actually think that right now when we look back, the march of progress seems linear, but in the moment it's not. And I don't think that the the people who call themselves progressives on this or that issue own what is the progressive next step. I I. I just reject that. Like, I don't think it is progress to abolish the police. I, I, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to ever think that. And, and it's okay to say no. And it's okay to say, yes, we need better policing, but it doesn't look like abolishing it. And it's simplistic and dumb to tell people, oh, this is the, this is the way. Because it's not. Or even, even the hot button of the day, the trans issues and all this, and let's say women's sports. Yeah. I, I don't think it's necessarily obvious that the progressive thing is to fully sex integrate sports. I don't, I don't know if that's the next step right. in the progressive march. Um, and I think it's okay to question that, even if you're someone who's benefited enormously from progress. And certainly, I think especially if you are. Yeah, certainly having benefited from a system does not mean you have no right to question it, right? That's a way of silencing you know, dissenters yeah, in, a, think, in a very perverse way. And I think it means being realistic about what got us here. Yeah. That it wasn't the rock throwers who got me gay marriage. Raise your hand if you want to ask a question, and we'll have somebody who's going to come around and bring a microphone. How optimistic, if at all, are you about San Francisco, and what might your fellow San Franciscans, of whom I'm one, do to affect change there? Thank you. I'm super optimistic about San Francisco. San Francisco was ahead of the country by five years in, in some of the wackiest stuff, and it's ahead in the reform movement. I mean, you have 
like Grow SF, you have a bunch of new organizations that are coming up and saying, we want a livable city. Like, uh, we want a district attorney who fights crime, which I think Brooke Jenkins is doing her best. Um, I'm, I'm really optimistic. I think people kind of said enough. We're, we're, we're not going to be cowed by these labels and by these few nut jobs on Twitter or in the school board. And, and the fact of the recalls, the fact that Jessa was recalled, the fact that the school board was recalled, I mean, that was unheard of. It was crazy. The farmer's markets were crazy. It was wild. There were battles. You never see that. It's a political monoculture. And all of a sudden, it became a place where the moderate liberals stood up and said enough. And I, I, I'm optimistic. It's also just the most beautiful place in the world. Come on. Like, eventually, those hills will slough off the nuts, and a new group of nuts will come in. And, and that's, if anything else, you just kind of wait it out, and your kids will enjoy a whole new battle there. My, my question is, do you think that um, there's been a serious change of heart at the New York Times to try to revert to some journalistic standards that were uh, abandoned or at least kicked to the side of the road at, in 2016 on? Or do you think they're just business people and they're feeling the heat from the free press and Substack and Taibi, et cetera, et cetera, and they f feel like they're going to lose audience if they don't get credible? Well. I like to think that the free press has results, gets results. And so I like to think that NPR will now go through a reformation um, thanks to our whistleblower's essay and that we'll all... Um, I did find it heartening that Joe Kahn said that. I mean, the fact that he had to say in a big announcement that we are not going to be the mouthpiece of Joe Biden and that that was considered controversial tells you a lot about the rhetoric internally. And, and what he's pushing up against. Um, but <laughs> it's a big paper. There's thousands of reporters, and a lot are brilliant. It's, it's a lot are amazing. Um, do I think that they can push against this movement that's coming up through the ranks that really has a different version vision for journalism? I'm not super optimistic. I also think the business model of being a subscription business versus an advertiser business is it's just a lot easier for to to fall to audience capture. I mean, yeah. uh, we we as we grow will struggle with the same thing. It's your audience sees you as a sword for their battle. And so the New York Times subscriber sees the New York Times as a sword for their battle. And so it's good business what they're doing. I mean, their numbers are amazing. So yeah. I don't know if we're going to see some huge reformation, but it's nice rhetoric, and, I, and I'm and i happy he's a free press reader. I was loving that. Can you talk a little bit about audience capture? Um, you know, because most publications, I mean, the model of, you, you know, advertising-based uh, revenue is kind of dying everywhere yeah. on TV, on radio, in print, online. Um, how at the free press, how do you prevent from just becoming an echo chamber for what you think your readers want it's, and will pay for? All of us in this are now in a constant battle with that. I mean, in the same way that when you were, when, when advertising was the main mm -hmm. business, that was a risk. How do you make sure that you're not just trying to please the local mall owners and trying to like keep the car companies happy? It's, it's a, you have to be constantly thinking about it and, and protecting yourself from it. Um, I think it's helpful in the free press's case because we have a really diverse readership. So there's not like one clear free press reader, <laughs> which I have learned a lot through the Where I TGs. It is a truly diverse group of people. I mean, you have the... the Please insult them No, now, no. The, your and, TGIF I know I'm readers. obsessed uh, with them. Yeah. I'm obsessed. But it's like people from all over, from all walks of life, from all politics. So if I was trying to please them, I'm trying to please the PhD student who's sending me a Where I TG from Yale and the farmer who's sending me a Where I TG and he's showing me his goats. Like, I, I don't know how I would please both of them. There's a lot of ham radio operators and pilots. I don't know how I would please them. I wouldn't mind. Um, I, it's, it's such a eccentric group who have come together. I mean, the people in this room, like what you know, it's such a weird movement of free thinkers, whatever we want to call ourselves in this moment, uh, that I think it would be very hard for us to suffer from audience capture. At some point, I mean, we, we do think about it, and I, I'm sure as we grow to be, you know, on par with, let's say, the New York Times, obviously, within the next year, 
Um, mm. we're, we'll think about it even get more. A, get a comics page and you're halfway there. <laughs> I know, we need some uh, games. Another question. Just wanted to ask, since this is a largely free market uh, group here, um, is there a way that, that we can invest in, in some kind of venture, or have you seen a venture, where we can get people to start laughing at their own absurdities so we can start loving our crazy friends again instead of just yelling at each other? Free Press CEO Barry Weiss is here to talk about all investment opportunities as we grow to be the size of the New York Times within I, uh, a year. I think you we you'll want a they're you'll very want reliable. A tax, you'll want a tax advantage donation to the nonprofit <laughs> reason foundation. A 501c3 here, Nick, research Nick, and education. Nick, it's progressive one. stack time. Let's do uh, <laughs> let's do one more uh, question, please. Um, I was going to ask if you think the arc of history bends toward justice and whether your <laughs> view on that You think I'm so much smarter time. than I am? That's an amazing <laughs> question. Wow. Yeah. Anyone? Does it bend towards vol audience volunteers? No. Yeah. We've got to know. No, you gotta, you, you're the raise, author. You raise gotta, your, okay. Yes or no? No, I can't do. <sighs> Not necessarily. No. No, I think that what we have, liberalism, these amazing societies where people can disagree and not hurt each other, where, where we have a kind of agreed upon set of rules that are so fragile, I mean, I think it can fall. I, I do. I think it has. We've seen it. I mean, you, you see it around the world. What we're doing now and maintaining this is the hardest thing humans do. It's a remarkable exception to our norm, which is uh, chaos and tribalism and brutality and nastiness and tr like all of these all of these movements that we're seeing that seem so irrational and that seem like the exceptions. Those are the rule. We're th this is the exception. Um, so no, I don't think it bends towards justice or, or, or towards goodness, and I don't think necessarily that's a given, and I don't think it's forever. I think we're living in a really special moment that will last maybe a few generations. What do you think? Um, I'd like to think it's going to last for at least 50 more years, when, and then I can cash out. <laughs> Nick right? just wants to make sure he can I, die. Um, you know, as a, as a <laughs> final uh, question for you, uh, I wanted to ask, because the book, as a couple of people have mentioned, is is a delight to read. It's it's both funny, it's extremely well reported, and two writers are kind of like guardian angels uh, for the book: Tom Wolfe and Joan Didion. Joan Didion is referenced in your title. She wrote a famous essay called "On the Morning After the '60s," very Californian. Uh, and I do not pretend to be as good as okay. Tom Wolfe or, or as, Joan Didion, or as thin as Joan Didion, or as right? thin yeah, as, as Joan uh, Didion, is, right? or as well dressed as Tom Wolfe. Yeah. So or, uh, I was going to ask, though, what uh, I, you know, what what is their, um, you know, are they kind of like your, uh, uh, you know, parents, influenced parents, or what? Are you a big fans of those? And what did they bring to journalism? That oh is, oh my god, distinct? they brought everything. They brought everything. What did Joan Didion bring to journalism? You're asking a 35-year-old white woman, 36, what Joan Didion brought to journalism? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have three hours to yeah. sit, Nick? Like, what are you doing for dinner? Um, um, I, they brought uh, they brought skepticism and laughter and darkness. They brought. I mean, they they made journalism storytelling. Um, they did. I don't know, guys. I, I'm I'm such a freak for them. I'm gonna mm -hmm. sound like a crazy person. Um, I think a lot also about PJ O'Rourke. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he is an underappreciated character. He was once kind of the most quoted political commentator. Um, and I'm trying tomorrow, actually, we're publishing a piece that's about, that's the Free Press's first book club, and it's going to be to go reread some PJ O'Rourke. Um, and I think what they had that is lacking now, and I don't pretend to be the torchbearer. I hope that a better writer than me becomes the torchbearer, or, or a lot of better writers do. But I think that they had empathy, but also curiosity, and that they were willing to be somewhat brutal. Like Joan Didion's best essays are brutal and fair, but harsh. And I think um, it's really hard 
when you're thinking of yourself as a partisan or as a political actor. It's very hard to be a mirror and to to be honest about what you're seeing and what you're experiencing. And I think that they were very good at that and that that has been kind of lost in a lot of now the feeling of journalism as um, tool of your of your politics and tool of, of, of your, of your tribe. Um, and I hope we bring some of that back soon. I hope, I, I think that's coming back a little bit with the, the kind of Substack world with the new world of media companies that, um, aren't Fox news. Like you're not going to find Tom Wolf in Fox news. You're not going to find uh, this in the times anymore either. And, um, anyways, I think the new world promises to bring some of that back. Well, the book is Morning After the Revolution, Dispatches from the Wrong Side of History. Nellie Balls, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you so much.